rich up here and go, I wish that was me. I hope you say, you know what, maybe that can be me. Maybe I can become a pillar in the house of the Lord to help. You can't go higher with, unless you have pillars on this level. And so we need to, how many of y'all want to go higher? Um, rich and Stacy have been here really, Stacy since the beginning. And both of them went through uh, disruptions in the covenant of marriage that really were not in their choice. Uh, and by the grace of God, they operated according to the will of God for true restoration and healing. And in the mix of being faithful in the house of the Lord, the Lord is always faithful in the house of the people. And he restored them and brought them together after both experiencing um, shattered homes, God brought them together and has made a mosaic of beauty out of it. And in that now, there's families that have blended, and all of those families, including children and grandparents, are serving in the house of the Lord together. It is a generational model. These two have, they have started, this is not a show, this is, this is slamming a pillar into the ground. These two have been faithful. Stacy took over children's ministry when we, when we w were in a deficit. She established order and brought grace and truth to it, and she brought what she brings. This woman does not play. And Rich has led men in this house. Come on, how many of y'all have been prayed for, blessed by, ministered to? He has rallied men for man up. He's rallied men for breakfast as he has rallied life groups. They do marriage ministry together. And in fact, this semester, they were introduced by a marriage ministry outside of this church to bring a new li a life group back to fruition and modernize it. And they were a test pilot that will now minister to, if not thousands, hundreds of thousands of couples over the next 10 years. We are grateful to have you. We are better because of you. And today we will anoint you as an elder. Well, it's, it's an honor to be here. And particularly when asked by the pastor if, I, if I'd share in this, in this moment. And I think the, the term elder is, is not completely understood in our congregations or in our world probably because it has roots that are a lot different than elderly people. Um, you can be an elder and still be 30. So it's a governmental term. And when, when Moses' father-in-law saw the burden that he was carrying to try to deal with about 2 million people, someone said, if you have two Jews, you have company. If you have three, you have an argument. So. Moses dealt with people who argued all the time, and he was trying to answer all of them, and God gave him wisdom. Choose some people who can lead some people, and if their problem is too big, they can bring it to you. And obviously, in this house, you need people who can care for people when the pastor isn't aware of what's going on. Your leadership is a governmental role. You're positioned, you're being positioned by your pastor to be a, sh a sharer in this moment. The challenge that you face there is that when he receives a mantle for leadership, you come under that mantle. And so the same kinds of pressures that he's experiencing, you're going to experience. The same kind of victories you're going to experience. And many times, your, your ability will be encouraging him, lifting him up, and praying for him. And because God's given someone like you to him, you're going to see things that he doesn't see. So you're going to be a spotter. And you're going to say, hey, honey, I think you probably want to consider this. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and when she says that, it would be wise for you to consider this. <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking out of a context of having not considered it at various times and so the best experience is, is someone who's had it and will tell you how to, how to have it. So we're coming together with your congregation and they are approving whether they know it or not and they are committed to sustain you in the same way they're sustaining him. That the growth of this church will depend upon strong men and strong women who understand the gift of strong men in a society where strong men are no longer available most of the time. And so we're grateful for you, grateful for the testimonies that are associated with you. And we're just going to pray for you. And uh, you, you're being set apart. And the Bible teaches 
y'all, yens, you all, you people. Y'all here. The Bible teaches that elders are worthy of honor. So even though you can call him by his first name, you don't have to call him elder, but you do need to honor the gift that God's put among you. And the more you honor, what you honor, you get more of. And there are more in this house. Heaven had 24 elders. You won't need that many. But you will need some who can say, God, I will take on the responsibility of caring for the flock. And I appreciate being here today to participate in this moment. We're going to pray for you. And, uh, and then if God gives us a word for you, we're going to do that. Pray for you. You're going to anoint them. Would you stand? Father, in this moment, it's a holy moment. I often wonder if heaven just pauses for a moment as the kingdom is established deeper into the earth. Jesus, you said... To your apostles, I, I give you the keys to the kingdom and hell by no means. The gates of hell will never overcome it. Jesus, you told us to establish the church and to go forward and advance the kingdom. And today, I believe not only is Generations House of Worship better as we install Rich and Stacy into this eldership, mature ones, leaders of this church but I believe the kingdom of heaven is greater on earth because mm. of it I thank you for faithfulness thank you. in the house of the Lord I thank you for authority to take what is happening in the house and to establish it in the houses we are a church for the church and today we are better thank you Father Barbara and I stand in this holy moment with this amazing church and celebrate the gifts that you've entrusted to this house, this great family, the awesome work that they're going to do. And today we speak a blessing of the Lord over them, that blessing that makes rich and adds no sorrow to it. There's coming a moment in your life in the near future when you will understand the measure of the gravity and the, and the authority that God's entrusted to you. Measure your words for what you say in this season will be taken more seriously than what you said in a previous season. The weight of your words will not be small, but they will be heavy. So if you have to rebuke, rebuke with kindness and with gentleness, wow. knowing that your words are going to go deep and they're going to be the power of encouragement or the power of discouragement. Your wife is being given to you as someone who can see things. She has a seer yep. spirit. She has a seer prophetic anointing. It doesn't manifest itself by vocalizing. It manifests itself by seeing. Mm. And the things that she sees many times will be things that you don't see, but you have to trust the God who has given her to you yes. and given something to her for you and for this house. And we thank you, God, that the new level of this house is being strengthened by this eldership. And you're going to establish in this house what you've had in mind all along. Get ready for a season of multiplication and a season of strength. Jesus name. You are being strengthened today by the words that have been pronounced over the two of you. Your wife is your help and she's going to see some things that you won't. So don't ever harden your heart to the words that she's going to speak because God has placed her in your life to watch your back. Yeah. 
And uh, you were to be grateful and thankful. And you were to honor him. See, if you ever want to see a fight, is when a woman is fighting for her man. And so there are certain things that won't be said and done in your presence because of the strength that God's going to give you and the eyesight that he's going to develop. So God is going to bless you. I see you both moving in healing ministry. You're going to be praying for the sick, and you're going to see mighty miracles take place. And we honor that spirit that God gives us because there's so many people that need help and that a lot of times they are not ever heard. But God is stirring this church and our church with open eyes to see and to take care of the poor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Rich, this certificate is presented to you, given evidence that God has called you into the gospel ministry, licensed to preach the gospel as he may give you opportunity and to exercise the giftings and callings in the work of ministry. Licensed today as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as an elder of Generations House of Worship on the second day of June, 2024. Thank you for your faithfulness to the house of the Lord. Come on, can we show honor? Where honor is due. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I am going to yield. And I want you to know this. We don't need guest speakers at this church. We have men and women of God who can bring the, the gospel here. Amen. Bishop is... I don't, I don't, I don't, this isn't a, a toy. This is one of the greatest loaded barrels in the whole earth is the pulpit. And sadly, I think there has been misfires and negligent, negligent discharges around the world. But at Generations House of Worship, I want to bring in snipers, the most accurate men and women of God, so that we can go higher and further than we've ever gone before. It is an honor to have you here with us today. And I know that we will be better because of what you impart. I want you to understand the, the, the true ministry of, a, of an apostle or a bishop, a pastor, is impartation. It's not that we just take something away, but we truly receive something that makes us better. And so um, I yield the pulpit as a son. I would not be here today without this ministry of this faithful couple and I'm grateful that, that he's here to impart into us with his wife and his team. Do you receive the bishop? Can we show honor today? Can you stand and honor the man of God? Thank you. You, you can be seated, or, uh, unless you want to stand. Um, Paul wrote to the church at Rome and he said, I long to be with you that I might impart to you a spiritual gift. He said, not just that I have something to give to you, but that we can be mutually encouraged by each other. So in coming, impartation takes place in two different ways, both ways. It's going and coming. And I just leaned over and I said to Barbara, I said, they got some great singers there. The worship is wonderful. The atmosphere is so encouraging to me because years ago, when you couldn't get white people and black people together, we did. Come on. <laughs> so, so, to come, so to come here and to see what's taking place. And uh, I, just, I just want us to pray for you that um, that God will give you so much more of what he intended for Pittsburgh to have. And that, that word that we've been saying for a number of years that God's desire was that Pittsburgh would be more famous for him than for steel. And I believe 
your life here and your ministry here is going to produce the kind of thing that God wants to see. And I'm grateful that you are part of a team that God has developed. It's been a vision that we've had for a long time. And, uh, and now I realize God never intended for me to do it all. But he has someone in heart. So would you pray for them, honey? Father, we give thanks this morning for this precious couple and for bringing their lives together, especially connecting their names, Nick and Nikki. <laughs> Meet Joe and Barb. Hallelujah. <laughs> but we thank the Lord for the heart, the hearts that you have for the kingdom of God and to listen to your hubby just talk about Jesus. It makes you want to get saved all over again. Amen. That's how enthusiastic he is about the kingdom. And to hear your beautiful voice. I'm not a singer, but I know good singing when I hear it. So I just pray that this is going to be the launching of a new era in your life. For this house and for the, the city that you're in that God's going to show your hands to be mighty through him to help to change this city. And that we are going to stand together as united people in this Pittsburgh area to win the kingdom, to win the world, to the kingdom of God. So we pray that your health would be strong and very vital. We cancel every curse word that's been placed on you through the power of the name of Jesus. And we release his grace yes. in a large measure over you and to this house in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Hallelujah. I get an opportunity to pray for my husband everywhere we go together. And uh, what I say, we've, we've been married 52 years. We never talked about divorce, but murder has come up a couple times. So... <laughs> So he's a wonderful man and a gifted preacher and teacher. And he loves Jesus more than he loves anybody else. And so I'm honored to just touch him and just pray over him that God's going to use him because the Lord knows every need that's in this room this morning. So, Father, we thank you for our bishop, and we thank you for his commitment to the kingdom. We thank you for his attitude about saying yes to you at any cost. So we ask this morning that you release through him the words that need to be spoken yes. Yes. that will change any negative thing that has been going on, that success is in the air for this church yes. and we thank you yes. that we're going to play a little small part in that today in Jesus name amen, amen. amen. hallelujah Isn't she lovely? <laughs> She's amazing. Great. So you have a holder. Gotcha. Okay. That's a that's a keep it from being knocked over. I'll give you one. No, this is great. I got an extra one. All right, he's got an extra one. Come on. I'd have to take it with me. It's it's a joy to be here. Um, 
one of, one of my, the guys who travels with me frequently, uh, we get to go to a lot of churches and, and people say to us, our music is really good. And, and, uh, and so we, we developed this saying, there's a, nothing like really good worship. And, uh, and sometimes we'll go to a place and we will leave and we'll look at one another and say, that wasn't nothing like really good worship. <laughs> but this is really good worship. And I've been involved in worship ministry for, for decades. And so I get to understand and sample some things in other parts of the world. And what you guys are doing here, what you have here in this community is some of the best that I've heard and, and enjoyed. When I can get my daughter and my wife to both lift their hands in an atmosphere like this, and you guys have something. And I'm grateful for my daughter, Benita, and my son, well, actually, he's, we, he, he would be called son-in-law, but I don't think of him that way. So when I introduce him, I say, this is my son, and they look at me and look at him, and they don't know what to say. <laughs> but he's a good guy. Whenever we're traveling, sometimes uh, my wife is in a wheelchair, so we can expedite our travels through it, and, and so Benita's with us, and others are with us, and then Wes is, is with us. And then when Wes comes up, the security says, no, you have to go this way. And so we got to look back and say, he's with us. He's with us. He's a good guy. And then my, my dear friend Charles, who is, who's with us from, uh, he's from the city of Pittsburgh. It's good to be here. Thank you, sir. The musician, I enjoy what you do. It's good. Do you have a D key in there or someplace? All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. You know that song? Sing it with me, come on. All my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I was ministering in a in the suburb of Chicago. It was a weekend, marathon weekend actually, and I think I must have spoken about seven or eight times between Saturday and Sunday night. Sunday night, I was tired. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I, didn't want, I just wanted to get out of there. So when the pastor dismissed the service, I jumped up and I ran out. And there was a guy chasing me, and he said, Bishop Carling, the bishop, but I acted like I didn't hear him. Because I was tired. I didn't want to say hallelujah. I didn't want to say praise the Lord, saints. No, no, I just I wanted to get out of there. And I did. I ran into the green room, and I sat down, and he came into the green room after me. And I said, come on, it's the green room. And he said, he said, didn't you hear me calling you? Now, I believe you get only so many lies you can tell in life. And, and I wasn't about to waste one. And so I just looked at him. He said, I had something I wanted to give you. And then he had my attention. Especially when he held, he held up an envelope that looked like, it looked like an offering envelope, but it was really thick, and, and uh, it had money in it. And he just gave it to me, and he didn't ask for a conversation, he didn't ask for prayer or an autograph. He walked out, and it occurred to me, he had something to give me, and I was running from him. And so I love that line in the song, your goodness is running after running after me. And that's what it's doing. The goodness of God is pursuing you, even when you don't want to be pursued. 
it's coming after you, even though you think the footsteps behind you are somebody who's trying to get at you, when it really is goodness and mercy following you. And God's intention is to do it as long as you live. Tell somebody, I'm glad the goodness of God. It's a part of my life. Pastor Nick has been trying to get me to come here. And, uh, and of course, I've been traveling quite a bit. And so we finally worked it out. And uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for your time with us and our time with you. I want to share a word with you. But I also brought some resources because somebody said you can't preach at all. So I have some resources. My associate put together messages that I've, I've, I've shared on a card. Do you guys remember DVDs? <laughs> How about CDs? You remember CDs? Well, the, come on, see? So here we are. These are sets of messages with different focuses. One is on wealth, one is on worship, one is on warfare, one is on the will of God, and, and one is on the blessings of God. Each one of them has about 20 messages on it, and uh, they're going to be available at the back table. And we're instructed to take 50% off whatever the price is. And then there's a book I wrote. It's, I, I, I think it's the best book I've ever read on worship that I wrote. And, do you have this book? You don't have this book? And do you have any of these cards? Do you have anything? <laughs> that, 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 you got me. I got you, I got you babe. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So my daughter will be at the back table, and if there's anything that you think the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about, you say, I want that. And if you... And if you can't afford it. Now, are we, are we going to do this all, all day? Are you guys, are you going to interact with me? Okay, then that's what I want to talk about. I was listening to the preparatory worship back there, and, uh, and it was loud, and it was going. And, and I'm trying to meditate on the scriptures and I told somebody I said this must be their devotional time where <laughs> but it's amazing to be in a house where people enjoy what God is doing in, in the earth before I say something I want to say something a rabbit walks into a butcher shop and says to the guy, do you have any carrots? He said, no, we don't have carrots here. This is a butcher shop. And he said, okay. He came back the next day, walked in, he said, hi. He said, do you have any carrots? He said, I told you yesterday, we don't have any carrots. This is a butcher shop, get out of here. He says, okay. He comes back the third day and he says, got any carrots? And the guy says, if you come back here tomorrow, I'm going to drive a nail through both of your paws. And he said, okay. Two weeks later, he came back. He says, hi. He said, got any nails? The guy says, no. He says, got any carrots? <laughs> Sometimes you got to find a way to make your requests without getting into trouble. There's a passage in 2 Kings chapter 6 that I would like for you to view with me. And um, as Britney Spears said to her second husband, I won't keep you long. <laughs> how, how, much, how much time do I have? I mean, is, is, is there a timer on here? Second Kings chapter 6, verse 14. Uh, you guys ever sing the song, this is how we fight our battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Well, the theme of that song comes from this text, and it's about a situation in which the prophet Elisha is warning the king of Israel every time 
another king has set a trap for him. So God gives him the directions. And, and so it frustrates the enemy king. And they find out who's responsible. And he says, he says, it's Elisha. And he says, go get him. And so the king gets the largest army. And let me just read it to you. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servants said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I want you to hear this phrase, and then I want you to repeat it after me. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Would you say that, please? Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Say it again. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray, open my eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Let me set a picture for you. There are two armies there, two armies that are visible, and that's a vast army. He's, he's marshaled. He's coming with power because he needs to get rid of this guy. And he's got all of his army. He's got chariots. He's got horses and all of that. The other armies. And then when the servant sees the visible army that looks massive, he turns to his master and he says to him, we're in serious trouble. He says, look, look out there. And so Elisha comes and Elisha says something like this. Oh, don't be afraid. Have you ever noticed in the Bible when God says, don't be afraid, it's already too late? <laughs> so what the guy is saying to him, uh, can you tell me why I shouldn't be afraid looking at all of this? And then Elisha says, those who are with us, say that, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, what he's describing is that there exists, along with the two visible armies, two invisible armies. The invisible army that's with Elisha consists of chariots of fire and horses surrounding them. The king has come with his army we think only in terms of a physical army, but a physical army that's demonized and energized by demonic activity has a, an accompanying army. That the army that's with that physical enemy is also a spiritual army. And so the Bible says our struggle is not with flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against persons with bodies. Our struggle is with things, entities, beings that you cannot see that are all around you. And the only comfort you ought to get from that is that there are beings and powers that you can't see that are on your side who are also all around you. The angel of the Lord in compasses those who love him. So this army is great, and he's looking at them. And the thing that I want us to get is this. There is a hidden opposition that goes against you and every desire that you have to serve God. Sometimes it's blatant in your face, and sometimes it's just subtle. Our problem is that we don't discern it, and because we don't discern it, we get tripped up on a regular basis. And I, pr I probably have seen more people who have submitted to things that they didn't have to submit to because they were unaware of the army that was with them. Are you all breathing? Good. I love that bird that's joined us because if I can't get an amen from you, it's just constantly saying it. So I'm saying, hey, this is good. This is really good. 
the struggle is real. Would you say that, please? Say it again. Often you think of an incident that is coming. We just say, well, I just had all these issues. My tire blew out, and this happened, this happened. And you know, well, life is like that. Life is like that, but the problem is, why is it like that, and who's responsible for it? I don't, I don't take accidents. There are no accidents. There may be wrecks, but there are no accidents. When, when the enemy is coming after you, he's coming after you, and the, the idea, the goal of the enemy is not to let you know it's him. And so when, you're, when your kid comes and looks at you in the kitchen and just simply says, I'm leaving, I'm going some other place, and you think it's just him. The Bible says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Now tell somebody, if you got a kid, it's flesh and blood. And that's not your problem. And you're, you're trying to figure that part out. She's screaming, she is screaming, she's screaming. And you're saying, God, what's going on? What is going on? And so you take her to a psychiatrist and he gives you medication and she screams softer. <laughs> but she still screams. And the thing is, is that medication doesn't get rid of demons. I don't believe in demons. I believe in God who told me about demons. And so when he says to me, you will cast out demons, not be comfortable with them. Learn to live with demons because that's, no, no, Jesus never said that. Get rid of things that are going on in your life. Deal with this thing that there are, there are oppositions, there are opposers who come against you. I, I go into meetings all the time. We, we're involved with people all over the world. And I've learned to recognize that there are moments in my life when an encounter is going to take place because I walk in light and people who walk in darkness can see the light I walk in. And so they're opposed to that. And they'll, and they'll stop us sometimes and say, what's different about you? And I say, what do you mean what's different about me? Because they're seeing something they don't see. And so here's Paul's prayer. Paul's prayer to the Ephesians is that I'm praying that the eyes of your heart will be open so that you can see. In fact, let's look at that passage. It's in Ephesians 1, 18. The problem is, I shouldn't say the problem, but the result of what's taking place with this servant who can't see, it's there. They were there before he saw it. Elisha didn't have to see it. He just knew it. And when he says to him, those who are with us, are more than those who are with them. He's declaring a spiritual reality. They are here. You're looking at an army, and you can only see that, but I know of an army that they can't see and I can see, and he's with us. And so here's what Paul prays in Ephesians 1.18. Are you there? He says, I, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is the surpassing greatness of his power? What is the surpassing greatness of his power? What is the surpassing greatness of his power? What is the surpassing of his power toward us who believe? Toward us. These are in accordance with the working and I want you to look at these, these various words that Paul's using. In accordance with the working of the strength of his might, the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Paul sums up a theological revelation that only he was given. He sums it up with, with words that depict strength, the power of God, the energy of God, the might of God, the greatness of God, that when God exercises power, and we think of it as power, when God exercises power, God's just being who he is. Now, when you say, Ugh, God doesn't have to say that. But I think he said it on one occasion. And that was when he reached down into hell and got his son and pulled him up out of hell, 
passing through the heavens and seated him at the right hand of God. Power was displayed. He says that same power is working on your behalf. That same power that's working on your behalf enables you to say to someone who is demonically energized, come out in Jesus' name. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to. I, mean, look, I grew up in a church, and we believed in deliverance and getting rid of demons, but there was a way we had to do it. And, and, uh, and I was in a church where revival was going on, and I saw this lady praying for a demonized girl. And she was just praying just very gently. Drive it out, Holy Spirit. Just drive it out. Drive it out, Holy Spirit. Just, and I'm looking at her. I said, girl, ain't nothing happening. Man. You, you're going at that the wrong way. And she kept saying, drive it out. And then, then I noticed this girl took a sigh, and her countenance brightened. And I'm staring at her, and I says, wow. Because in my training growing up, if you wanted to get a demon out, you had to look like one. I find you, you saw a demon in the name of Jesus. Come out, come out. She wasn't doing that. She was so laid back. Maybe it was because she was white and didn't know any better. <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm just trying to find you, okay? That's right. That's right. If, if there's anything still going on in you, I'm going to get it out. All right. but, like, and I'm watching this because we have worked hard. I mean, uh, hours, just hours getting demons out of people because it's not by power but by might, but it's our power and our might that's doing it because I'm hoarse after screaming at him all the day. But when this lady said, drive it out, Holy Spirit, I saw this person just say, ah. and I said, wow. I said, man, that's easy. And I heard him say, my yoke is easy. When you are using your internal energy, in fact, when you pray for people, and if you have an expectation for them to fall after you, when you're praying for them and they don't, if you push a little bit, Tell somebody, say, if it's the Holy Spirit, you don't have to push. In fact, if you sense that maybe I should push a little bit, that's when you need to back off completely and say, Holy Spirit, if you want him to stand, fine. If you want him to lay down, fine. My sister-in-law, I, I, well, Barbara's sister-in-law, uh, she wasn't mine at the time, but she was Baptist, black Baptist, and she said, I wish to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I don't want to fall. I said, fine. So I prayed for her, and I said, Holy Spirit, dear Jesus, she wants to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but don't let her fall. He heard the first thing, but he didn't hear the second. <laughs> because he filled her with the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm looking at her, and uh, I laid my, moved my hand, and she fell. She fell on her tukas. I mean, bam. It, you know, sometimes people, some gently fall, but hers wasn't like that, so it was a bam. It was un, an uncouth. But when her butt hit the floor, she started speaking in tongues. And I looked at her, and I just said, I'm sorry. Well, when I came back, she had this glow on her face, and I said, I, I'm really, I, I try not. She says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm saying to you that who he is is power. Who he is is lion and lamb. Sometimes he'll be a lamb and sometimes he'll be a lion. And if he's a lion, it's because you need him to be one. So here he is, and he's saying, I need you to understand that that power that is working towards you, that power that's here in your favor. Look at it again. The surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance. The power is toward us. Say that. His power is toward us. It's toward me. It's toward me. It's in my favor. And whatever is coming against me, I need to be aware of the fact that there are more on my side of the battle than on their side of the battle. The enemy is real. And he's going about, the scripture says, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But as we were singing, we said, Jesus is righteous. 
Jesus is this, Jesus, and then we, we came to that phrase, we said, Jesus is the lamb. He is the lamb, but he's also the lion. And there are times when you encounter the lamb, and there are times when you need to meet the lion. And the enemy tends to want to encounter the lamb in you because he knows he can overwhelm you. Get this, please. It's, it's in me and for me and towards me. It's his power. Now, I want you to look at a confession so that I want you to get a good idea of who you are as we move into the rest of this message. And I have 10 more minutes. So can we put that on the screen? I call it the confession of a spiritual being. Say, I'm a spiritual being. Say it again, I'm a spiritual being. I'm not just a human being having a temporary spiritual experience. I'm a spiritual being having a temporary human experience. Okay, the confession that I said, can you get that on the screen for us? <laughs> Say again. Welcome to your world. Hey, I've been in this world before, and, uh, but I didn't know it was as white as it was. Because <laughs> my world has a lot of people of color who believe in doing things by the Spirit. Which means it may not get done at all. <laughs> no. I love that verse, though, but that's, that's not the one. The verses are the ones I wrote. That's okay. If you repent quick enough, it'll get it up on the screen. Let me see if I can. I'll, I'll, find, I'll find a copy of it here. Just have a conversation with your neighbor for a minute. <laughs> I, I didn't want to do it this way where, where you repeat it after me, but um, I want you to say, just repeat the phrase after I say the phrase. I am not just a human being a having a temporary spiritual experience. I am a spiritual being having a temporary human experience. My daily struggle is not against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies who use people. My battle is spiritual. Even though my day-to-day -day experience is as a human being, I must be conscious that my experiences are not like other human beings. My experiences are spiritual. Every day, I'm contending in spiritual warfare. That's the normal Christian life. But I have been given powerful weapons to defeat any adversary. My weapons are spiritual. My enemies consider my weapons to be weak, futile, ludicrous. But they are wrong. Ask Goliath. They may look natural, but they are spiritual. Even though the battles may be intense, I am admonished not to be weary in well-doing. The victory is assured if I don't quit. I must always realize the battle is not mine. The battle is the Lord's. However, I still must be engaged. My mouth and my hands are instruments of worship and warfare. And I am committed to use them in his name. Shout amen. amen. All right, we got through that. Thank you, Lord. You are spiritual beings. The stuff that's going on in your life you cannot look at it in the same way other people look at it. When you became a Christian, you moved out of the typical response that people have in various situations. Sometimes people will wonder why, okay, you just totaled your car, but you, you're not sad, you're not. No, you said, no, I, I, I understand that the Lord gives 
and the Lord takes away. You can blame it on the devil, but Job didn't. And my need is to understand that there are things that are going on in your life and in my life that are not typical of what goes on in the lives of people who don't know Jesus. You are a chosen people. Say, I'm chosen. You are a generation, a special people. That's how God describes you. And if you don't understand that, in fact, if you understood it, you would probably walk a little more arrogantly. Like, you know, when I say arrogant, I'm talking about kingdom arrogancy, where you have a clear understanding. I know who I am. I know who I am who saved me. I know who brought me. I know that I'm not going to quit. I know that I'm not going to give up because when God raised Jesus from the dead, when he raised him up, he had to take him up out of hell where the enemies that of God were also there. Jesus goes into hell when he comes off the cross. His spirit goes into hell and he begins to declare the victory that he obtained on the cross. And the Bible says when he comes out, he comes out, and I love the psalm that says, who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, the Lord strong and mighty. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up your everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Jesus walks out of the king, and he says to John on the Isle of Patmos, he says, I am he who was dead, but now I'm alive, and I have the keys to death and hell. Jesus has the keys. Satan no longer has the keys. And so when God takes him up out of, the, out of hell, the scripture says he brought him out. He who, who, who came down from above went into the deepest parts and took captivity captive. And what he does is that all the believers who were in hell before Jesus died, when Jesus was raised up from the dead, he said, come on, saints, we're out of here. And that part of the underworld where believers used to go is empty. Because when you go now, you don't go down, you go up. You go into the presence of God. You're seated with him. And then the Bible says, not only am I seated with him, but I'm seated with him in the heavenlies. How is that? Because he has taken you by the Spirit, through your commitment to him, through your water baptism, and you ought to have one, through your baptism with the Holy Spirit, and you ought to have one, and he has put you in him, and he has sat you with him, and where are you today? I'm seated with him. Say, please, I'm seated with him. Where? Far above. All rule. All authority. You're there. And you just need to say, okay, I'm there. And if you believe you're there, you need to act like you're there. Just get excited about it. Say, oh, this trivial thing that's going on, this, it's, just a, it's just a matter of time. I can deal with it. But we encounter people who don't realize that they're having a hard time. And I'm looking at them. My computer won't stay on for some reason. Um, want to see my face? Okay, here we go. <laughs> a guy said his twin brother used his passport because they looked so much alike and he said I don't like that <laughs> now my wife taught me how to do this by helping her to do it here's what I'm saying I and chosen by God. The scripture says he has chosen you. The Greek word is, it, it's, a, it's a really fine word that speaks of a discriminate kind of selection. You're looking at some pearls or diamonds and you are looking over them and you're saying, don't like that one, don't like that one. And then you go for that one, you say that one. The guy says, man, you've chosen the best. When he says, I've chosen you, it means I have selected you out of a whole lot of other things. God didn't just say, he'll give me one of those. He says, no, I want that one. When he chose you, he, because he said, I want that one, I want her. When you saw her, everybody else disappeared. And you said, I want that one, I want that one. God chose you. 
The teacher asked Juan, Juan was in class one day, and she said, Juan, can you tell me the difference between choose and select? He says, select. He says, that's when I pick out something with discrimination. She said, Juan, that's great. She says, Juan, how about choose? He says, oh, that's what I wear on my feet. <laughs> I'm just going to keep you off your, off your feet for a moment. Here's the picture I want you to get. Here's the picture I want you to get. As Paul is working through this text in Ephesians, he gets to this place where he says he has lifted them. And would you look at it, please? In Ephesians 1.21. Are you still there? Yeah. All right. He says, he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Go to Ephesians 4 while we're still here in Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who, uh, he who descended is himself, also he who Ascended where? Far above all heavens. Heavens plural. Not heaven. Heavens plural. Go to Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is, our struggle is, our struggle is, our struggle is. It's not our struggle was. It's not our struggle will be, our struggle might, our struggle is. The issue for us is that you and I need to be aware that every day we are in a struggle. The struggle is always there. The struggle is real. The struggle is real. And so when you say, what happened? I'm kind of in the traffic. I was late and I almost lost my job. Struggle is real. There are things that happen to you that typical people will say, well, that's life. Sometimes it's warfare. Sometimes it's intentional. And the problem is, it would be helpful for you to be a little bit paranoid as to whether it's intentional or whether or not it wasn't intentional. Because when the enemy is after you, his goal is to hide the fact that it's him. And reality for us ought to be something that says, God, I, I need to know where this is coming from. When you have a battle in your finances, and you say to God, God, I'm having a battle in my finances. You need to be able to say this, God, I shouldn't be having this battle because I'm a tither. Excuse me a second. Joseph, in a moment, they're going to get this, so don't be discouraged, all right? All right. <laughs> if you're a tither, he says, I will rebuke the devourer. You don't have to walk around. I rebuke the devourer. I, Jesus says, no, 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 that's not your job. That's my job. I'll rebuke the devourer for you. I will open the windows of heaven for you. You can't open windows of heaven. Your arms are too short. You can't do it. But he says, I'll do it for you. And so when I'm faithful in my giving, when I'm faithful in my tithing, faithful in the thing that I'm supposed to do, God, I have to say to God, God, can you explain to me for a moment what's going on here? Why is this battle so real? And sometimes he'll say to me, it's because you are headed into a place. Paul says to the Corinthians in 16, he says, a wide door for effective service has been opened to me. And there are many who oppose me. And sometimes the opposition that's opposing you is a result of an opportunity that the enemy sees that you, that you don't see. He sees it before you. A wide door. Say a wide door. For effective service. will always have opposition. Opportunity and opposition are partners. And sometimes we'll look at the opposition. We'll think, well, maybe God's not in it. Maybe God is in it because of the opposition. Don't look at the opposition and say, well, it, it must not be God. Maybe I miss God. No, no, no. You didn't miss God. And the enemy doesn't want you to think that way. So when I'm looking at opposition, we ask the question, what's the source of this opposition? Is it possible that God wants you to battle something because strength comes through continually pressing something. Where there is no resistance, there is no strength. Where there is no resistance, there is no strength. The Bible doesn't say yield to the devil and he'll run from you. Yeah, 
It says resist. Resist. You want to grow your biceps, you got to put some weight on them. And you put enough weight on them so the next day when you pick that same arm up, it hurts because you've ripped something open. But keep on doing it because it gets healed and it gets torn. It gets healed and it gets torn. And pretty soon you'll have, you'll have biceps like Popeye. But they don't come because you just say, biceps, come. I want to be saved. I want all that God has for me. I want the power of God to work in my life. But I don't want any trouble. And you don't get to choose that. Jesus says, he says to his disciples, he's saying, God, you're saying it's going to be hard for a rich man to get in. He says, I am not saying that to you. He says, but what about us? We've left everything to follow you. And God says to him, he says, look, there is no one who has left everything to follow me in this life, but he will have farms, land, houses, all kinds of stuff. 100-fold, he says, yes, yes, 100-fold. And then he drops this little thing in with persecution. 100 fold with persecution. God, I want the 100 fold blessing. He said, you can have it. But there's another suitcase you have to pick up if you want the 100 fold. Boy, God bless me, but man, all of a sudden, every kind of stuff is going on. This is going crazy because the struggle is real and the enemy doesn't want you to be blessed and if he makes you think if you're going to get blessed, you're going to have all kinds of problems, you just back away from blessing. I said, God, how about the 100 fold? Can I have 100 fold without the persecution? He said, no, but you can have the persecution without the 100 fold. <laughs> 100 fold blessing by itself is like a guy carrying a 100 pound suitcase and he's walking like this. God, I don't feel balanced. He says, it's because you left the other suitcase. Go get it. And you go get it. And you pick it up. That one has trouble in it. This one has 100 fold. I can live with the 100 fold and the persecution because I've been with the persecution without it. And it's like the guy said, rich and poor. But he says, I've been rich and I've been poor. And believe me, rich is better. Be blessed. This is, he says, I'm in Ephesians 6. Are you still there? Put on the full armor of God so you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is, our struggle is, it's present tense, our struggle is. You are always struggling. You may not be aware of it, particularly when you become strong in God. Certain things don't, don't affect you the same way. Our struggle is, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the, the forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces in the heavenlies. Now, here's the picture I want you to get. When Jesus is raised from the dead by the Father as the high priest he has to go to the real temple the real holy of holies and he has to present the blood of the lamb to the Father on his way up he has to pass through these heavens that have been populated by principalities and powers and wicked rulers and the demons and all of those things that we understand in the scriptures are there. But now what Jesus is doing, and I want you to hear this, it's in Colossians chapter 2. It says, verse 15, he says, when he disarmed the rulers and authorities, his, he disarmed the rulers and authorities, made a public display of them, having triumphed over them. When those demonic forces were constantly against Jesus, he was dealing with it all the time. He had to deal with it all the time. And you remember in the scriptures, it, Judas comes and he says to these guys, I know where he prays, and if you follow me, go with me. And the one who I kiss, hold him fast. He kissed them, but they couldn't hold him. They couldn't hold him. He says, they said, we got him. Yeah, you got him for three days. If they had known that by killing him, they were undoing their own stuff, they never would have done it. Had they known, if we pull him, if we put him to death, it's done. When, when, a, when a, a, a honeybee stings you, it only has one stinger. And if it stings you, it can't sting me. It can buzz, 
but it has no stinger. When Jesus took the thorn, when he took the stinger, there was no more stings left that could touch us. Only one sting. The sting of death came to him. He took the sting on the cross, went into hell, and said to Abraham and Isaac and all those other guys who were in there, no longer, not Enoch and, and Elijah, of course, because they weren't there. But he said to all of them, let's get out of here. And he walks out, and he's walking out, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory will come in. Who is the king of glory, he says? Come on. The Lord of hosts, mighty in battle. And when he walks out, John sees him in Patmos. And he describes himself, I am he who was dead, but now I'm alive. I am he who was dead, but now I'm alive. And I have the keys to death and hell. I've got the keys. And so my problem now is no longer to fear death because it doesn't have a stinger. Are you all quiet normally? Because you were, you were really going for it. Amen. I know, I know what it is. You're thinking. Colossians 2.15. I want you to hear this. One translation says he disarmed the rulers. When kings went into battle and they won the battle, the things that were left from the battle were called spoil. So that when you wiped out Somebody like, and the Bible says the spoil was so great in Jehoshaphat's day, it took them three days to gather the spoil. When Jesus spoiled them, he's disarming them. He's taking everything that gives them power to do what they do. And the Bible says he disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them. Public display, not necessarily public display to you and to me. He's a public display to those who in the heaven he's watching over this. Because there are still some good angels, a lot of them. There are still principalities that are on God's side. There are still powers that are on God's side. There are still rulers that are on God's side. They're there. And as Jesus is going up, get this, please. Listen to it in Colossians 2.14, Passion Translation. He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record. And the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us, he erased it all. Our sins are stained soul. He deleted it all, and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display. And then the transition goes on to say, they thought they had him captive, but he was theirs. Jesus isn't a prisoner to anybody, and anybody who serves him, the only prisoner that you are is to Jesus Christ. And so the writer of Hebrews says, he passed through the heavens, and on his way up, he's looking at all those principalities and powers who have held sway over the world's order and over kingdoms and over eras, and he's stripping them. He's taking their stuff off. He's taking it off. Their powers, their authority, the things that they've used to deceive worlds, to deceive kingdoms, to deceive uh, rulers of nations, emperors, all of them, he took that from them. And the Bible says he sits down at the right hand. And then he says to me, have a seat with me. Now, I can either see myself seated or I can see myself really just, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. The struggle is real. Now, go back to Ephesians 6. Time stands still. It wasn't work for Joshua. All right. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm. Having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of, of spiritual armor, where you, you have a knight in shining armor, it's got a helmet on, it's got a sword, and, it's, and, and so you, you begin to think in terms of physical and material. But he says, it's truth. There's a passage that I've enjoyed, it's in Psalm 15, but it's in the message translation. You ever read the message translation? You ever, you ever hear of the message translation? Eugene Peterson's wrote it. It's a great, great, great Bible. 
Eugene Peterson takes Psalm 15, and I want you to get this. He says, God, who gets invited to dinner at your place? How do we get on your guest list? And the answer is, walk straight, act right, tell the truth. Walk straight, act right, tell the truth. Say it again. What we don't understand is that telling the truth is a powerful weapon. See, when he says the belt of truth, it's like he's saying, bind yourself with this attitude, with this disposition, with this quality. I will never lie. Don't focus on I will never lie because it's hard to become something focusing on a negative. Say it this way, I will always walk in truth. Now, if you always walk in truth, guess what? You'll never lie. The teacher said, Bobby, why did you do that? He says, he said, I know. A lie is an abomination. but it's always a present truth. It gets you out of trouble. There's moments in your life when you think the only way out of this is to lie. But if it's part of your armor and that belt holds up your skirt or your pants, you pull that belt out and your pants or your skirt falls. Gird your loins with truth. <laughs> Say that please. Gird your loins without truth. When he says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? How do we get there? He says, whoever is walking straight, acting right, telling the truth. When he says, the breastplate of righteousness, what is righteousness? Righteousness is God's way of doing things. What would Jesus do? Take the Take the wristband off if you're not going to do what Jesus did. What would Jesus do? In this situation, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? The little boy was, he was harassing a kid in Sunday school, and my brother walked in, and the kid had his back to my brother, and he was just screaming on this kid. And he said to him, hey, boy, and he turned around, and he said, were you bothering that girl? He said, did you see me? Because your seeing me is going to determine what kind of response you're going to get from me. God sees us. Have you ever told a lie and then had to go back and say to somebody, well, I lied to you? Have you ever done that? I'm, I'm talking about in, in a real world. Have you ever done that? See, the policeman pulled me over and he said, did you see the traffic light? And I said, yes, sir, I saw the traffic light. That's what he wanted. But I do remember being pulled over by a policeman because I ran through a stop sign in my neighborhood. And I had a clergy collar on. I looked like an Episcopal minister. I was on my way to get some serious business done, and I just whisked on through it. I don't know where he came from. But I knew I was going to be in good shape because he was an African-American guy. He, he, he was a brother. And so... When he stopped me, <laughs> he said, you know, you ran through that stop sign. And I turned so he could see my collar, <laughs> thinking maybe he'll be impressed. <laughs> he wasn't. He gave me a ticket. So then I go to the court. And this same guy who gave me the ticket greeted me, shook my hand, said, great to see you, Rev. And I said, why weren't you like that at the stop sign? And so when I get into the court, I'm standing before the judge, and the judge says, he said, what do you plead? I said, I plead for mercy. He said, what does that mean? I said, I'm guilty of the traffic, but I don't want any points. Is it possible that I can pay the fine without points? He said, sure, and he just wrote it off. I'm saying to you that many times the thing that you think is going to work against you is the very thing that's going to work for you. Walk straight, 
Come on. Act right. You got, you got to walk straight, act right, and tell the truth. You got to walk straight, act right. And even if you're walking backwards, you need to walk straight. You need to deal with it. So when you're dealing with it from the standpoint of this, you're exercising your spiritual gifts. So he says, who's going to ascend? He says, those who walk straight, those who act right, those who tell the truth. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. And then there's this passage that says, the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of imaginations and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we look at that and we say, what are those weapons? What are those powerful weapons? And he says, it's walking. It's a powerful weapon. It's a powerful weapon. But we don't understand that. And then he goes on to say, don't hurt your friend. Don't blame your neighbor. Despise this despicable. Keep your word even when it costs you. Make an honest living. Never take a bribe. You'll never get blacklisted. I don't like the blacklisted word here. <laughs> he says, if you live like this, you'll never get blacklisted if you live like this. See, the devil thought he could persuade Job to cast, to curse God. The, the devil uses what I call actuarial principles. And he says, it's, it's in the nature of all men. When pressed, they will give up. When pressed, they will lie. When pressed, they will do this. And he says, and I know him. God says, you think you know him. All he's doing is measuring Job by all the other people who gave him up, who gave up, who walked in, who lied when put under pressure. He's measuring Job by them. He says, all people do this. And you need to say, all people don't do that. Your boss says to you, I'm going to get a call. I'm working in my office. And whoever calls me, tell them I'm not in. Sir, is there another way you, I can say that? No, just there's not another way. Sir, um, I'm not going to tell people you're not in when I know you're in. Do you want your job? Yes, but I don't want heaven more. And so we give way to principles that the world thinks are okay. Guy comes into the gas station and he says, give me $10 of gas and give me a receipt for 30 and the guy says, I can't do that. He said, everybody does it. He said, I'm going to do that. If you want $10 of gas, I'll give you a $10 receipt. Walk straight, act right, tell the truth. You'd be amazed at how powerful these weapons are to pulling down strongholds all around you. Can't trust that guy. If you tell him something and he, he, he's, look, you, you got to understand, he is not going to lie, guys. He's just not going to lie. And there's got to be something in this. God says in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 63 and 9, surely these are my people, children who will not lie. Uh, and a, a lie, the little boy said, is an abomination before God, but a present help in trouble. But it has consequences that are associated with it. My wife is a lie detector. And sometimes she detects it because she knows it's going on. If I could encourage you to understand that the struggle is real, but those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, why preach on spiritual warfare? Because you're in it, whether you like it or not. Well, I just like flowers. I just like things. I like nice stuff. I just like a party. You can like that but it's not going to change the world you live in. We live in a world now where truth doesn't matter. Righteousness doesn't matter. Justice doesn't matter. And you say, and like others say, well, if everybody's going to lie, why tell the truth? Because it's the only way to understand spiritual warfare. You got to Can I tell you, 
telling the truth is hard sometimes until you get accustomed to it. And once you get accustomed to it, it's no longer hard. Did you steal the purse? I didn't steal the purse. <laughs> what do you mean you didn't steal the purse? Well, I took the purse, but I didn't steal the purse. We have a way in our world of nuancing language so that we can lie without people knowing it. It's my concern isn't whether you know I lied, it's whether he knows I lied. Because ultimately, by the end of the day or by the end of the month, I, I just, I've learned this. Please stand with me as I close this on. By the end of the day, I'm going to have to go back and deal with it. It's a, it relieved the pressure in the moment. But now you're before God. God, if there's anything in my life that's displeasing to you, would you just reveal it to me? Because I feel like i got to go ahead now and just have this. God, can you just tell me, is there anything I need to deal with? He says, well, as a matter of fact, yes. Well, what has he got? You remember when you told Barbara three years ago, and she said, did you do this? And you said, no, because you felt the pressure. Because my wife and I don't argue. What's your name, sir? TJ. Barbara and I never argue. Now, the murder word that comes up is, is not a word I use. Okay. Uh, I'm just saying. But I've probably given many reasons for that word to be offered at various times. But we do have, while we don't argue, we do have intense fellowship. And in intense fellowship, men, on the whole, don't remember details. <laughs> Women, on the whole, remembers details. And she'll say, you always ask, don't no, stop, you stop, and, and, and say, just, she said, give me one moment, give me one moment, and I think, okay, all right, um, and I said, well, I'm thinking, you give me a moment. She says, okay, it was July 7th. You were standing in the kitchen. You had that brown hat on. You're done. Now, if Barbara can do that, how much more can the guy who sits on the throne? I'm saying, get it out of the way before you get there. Open your heart to him. Just say, God, I want to be all you created me to be. This church, whatever it started out to be, didn't become it. And like Jesus took those stone water pots and repurposed them for fresh wine, God repurposed this house. What kind of people need to be in this house? Those who It will create something in the community that explodes outside of the community. Your lives, your worship, your, your faithfulness, your generosity will be, it will be like leaven to a lump of dough. You don't have to go out there to make it happen. You can just be that in here. And all of a sudden, it just explodes into the community around you. God. What are our weapons? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God. What are y'all doing over there? That is so simple. What are you going to do today? Will it work? Tell somebody, say, this will work. Tell somebody, say, I'm in. Pastor, would you come up for a second?
it would be great. I'm going to say about a year from now, if this mantra becomes a, a part of your stones, yes, that you begin to act it out. What's our commitment this week? To walk straight. And you say it, you, you say it like the, like the woman who had the issue of blood, who kept repeating over and over again, if I can just touch this, if I can just, she didn't just say it one time, she said it. She said, if I can just touch, if I can just touch. It was her saying that moved her into her healing. If your saying becomes, we're the people who walk straight, act right, tell the truth, you'll become the people who Would you stretch your hands towards your pastor? Because he believes this. He walks this. He is this. He and Nikki are people of truth, people of integrity. And you're blessed to have the kind of relationship that God's given you with him. Father, I pray today that this amazing house of worship, this house that has touched the community, it's touched lives in ways that they will never know until heaven in the same way that my life touched Nick's life. Years ago, even before I knew him, they will meet people in this community and beyond whose lives have been changed simply because they made a commitment to walk. And so I just speak that blessing. I speak the strength of God over this house to fulfill this particular challenge so that it becomes easy because you said your yoke was easy and your burden is light. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. Let's give God a praise to have men of God in our lives, women of God in our lives that impart the divine nature of truth. For a moment, I want you to grab a seat and I wanna, I wanna encourage you. I know that Sundays, um, we, have, we have routines. Routines are good, amen? But purpose is better. Routines are good and routines develop purpose. It's our routines that have allowed us to develop a healthy ministry, but sometimes the purpose isn't the schedule. The schedule leads us to the purpose. And today, to stay a little bit longer, our Lower Borough Campus grinding through, the, our stream drop, they jumped on YouTube, Pastor Brandon and the team are getting around this word and, and, it's, and it's pouring into Lower Borough, people watching online. Um, there, how many of y'all know when you go to one restaurant, you wait for your food to come to the table and you're kind of like, hey, where's my food at? But when you're with someone like Bishop Garlington, when you're with, with uh, some of our pastors and our, uh, our, our um, overseers, don't think of it like we're waiting for the food to hit the table. Think of it like a buffet. And if you go to a buffet in a hurry, don't go to a buffet with me. Because I ain't doing it. You ask Rich Kulbacki and all of the squad that wants to go to uh, Texas Day Brazil, I bring stretchy pants and I never wear a belt because I am hungry and I'm going to walk straight to the buffet. Come on. I'm going to walk straight. And you know, if you at a buffet, you better act right. Huh? And if someone says you're still hungry, you said you better tell the and say yes. So God is on the move, and I am so grateful. I know some people got up, you know, probably had schedules and stuff, but you know what, man? I'm so grateful for the, the fact that we can go on afterwards and, and watch again and, and again and again. You took notes today. I hope you did. Taking notes is part of it. Reviewing your notes is the next part of it. Living your notes is the next part. No takers are what? I want to prophesy this because I want you to catch this in your heart. I want you to hear this because I believe there's an impartation today. Bishop, I promise you this, there will be a shirt very, very soon. There will be a shirt that says, you better, you better, and you better. And I'm going to have bracelets that got the acronym right up on the end of it. T cubed, tell the truth. All right. I want you to hear this. There are things you can say because you've come to believe it. There are things you know 
because you finally did it. But every once in a while, you get around people that can impart because they became it. Today, we have received impartation. You know, we say it often, and I believe it. We are a church that truly says we live to give and what? Yesterday, we had a phenomenal outreach to the whole community, ministered to people. People were blessed, and they said, why would you do this? People came up, they said, why would you do this for us? And I said, because we love you, and God loves you. When I watch TikTok or YouTube, they now have stars and gifts that you can give because you're receiving from people. So you can go, ooh, stars, 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 and hearts and hearts and hearts, and every once in a while people go overboard and they put like an exploding, you know, orangutan or something that pops up on the screen. They're like, thanks for the exploding orangutan. But what that really means is somebody, somebody said, whatever you're putting out is helping me, and I want to sow into you I want, to, I want to give you something to show you that I'm appreciating what you're giving. And you guys know at this church, we live to give, love to give, that we don't even really talk about giving. Because I truly believe that something the bishop said today, I hope you will get it. I don't ever, I don't care who you are, if this is your first time here or 20 millionth time here. I don't ever want you to get into the habit of just putting money in a box. I want you to put spoils in the king's hand. When the king gives you victory and says, whatever spoils are left behind are yours, when we bring gifts back to the Father through tithes and offerings, what we're really saying is, Father, I declare victory and what I have received in overflow as increase, I want to always cut off some of that to say thank you. I trust you, and I know this isn't the last time you're going to spoil me. See, when you're, a, when you're faithful in giving, I believe the Lord spoils us because he can trust us. When giving is what you look for, it's all you'll ever get. But when giving is something that you trust the Father with as the giver, he can give you more. Today, we're going to bless Bishop. We're going to bless his family. We're going to let him know that we are not only grateful for the two hours that you sat with us, but for the decades that you have sat over Pittsburgh and the world. Amen. I realized this, you know, when, when I wrote a book, I realized that book doesn't do much sitting on a shelf. And people have messaged our church and they said, Pastor Nick, I have led people to Jesus because I read your book and it helped me. And I'm like, two things I realized, oh my gosh, that's kingdom gain. And I just made 10 bucks. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest, I didn't write a book for money. But I'm like, oh my gosh, I made $45 last month on my book on Amazon. Now, that may not mean a big deal to you, but I'm like, people believe in me. That, when you, people sow into you, it shows, wow, you're grateful for me. And, and, and I'll just tell you, growing up with three dads, I didn't grow up feeling very loved or appreciated or received. But I'm grateful what God has done in this church, and I prophesy this over you, whatever you sow reveals what you love what you love. Lord, we love you. We want to walk straight. We want to. Part of our Freedom Life group, we say it is for freedom. He set us free. And Jesus said, whom the sun sets free is free. One of the biggest problems is the sun sets you free, but we don't walk straight after he set us free. And we end up back where we came from. And they blame God. And then they say, I don't know what happened. I tried it. It didn't work. No, 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 no. You tried it. You didn't live it. Let's walk straight out of here today. And let's get into life groups because guess what? The Bible says when one man walks by himself, when he stumbles, who's there to pick him up? When he's with the brother or sister in Christ, they can pick him up. And three, who can break him? That's why we have life groups and growth track. That's why we do what we do. We have growth track after service today. It's a one and done. I hate saying it that way. We're going to call it the one shot. And we've, we shorten it down a little bit. And we have, even from last month, so this one will be an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, and you're going to be from watching a church that you love to actually saying, this is my church, and I'm going to love it. Amen. So here, let's stand to our feet, and let's pray over our, here's what I want you to get in your heart today. I know you have your regular tithe and offering. 
What I'm going to ask you to do is sow above and beyond that today. My wife and I are going to sow. Um, and I'm not going to tell you the amount we're going to sow, but I'm also going to tell you we ain't ballers, y'all. If everybody does something, we can send the man of God out of here going, wow, not only did that church receive the word, they received me. I believe in honor. Amen. I'm not going to let a TikTok star or a YouTube star get more stars than the, than the sons and, and daughters of the Most High God that pour into us. So let's lift our tithes and offerings to the Lord. My wife and I have already given ours. Let's pray over them and de declare this with me, with your own mouth. Say, Father, my tithe is not my choice. It's a cut. It's a true percentage. I can't tell the IRS, I think I'll give you this much. Father, the tithe, according to the Bible, not according to my pastor or anybody else, the tithe is yours. It is a tenth of whatever you gave me in my last increase. My tithe reveals what I love. It reveals what I trust. My offering is anything above that. It reveals my faith and what I believe in and where we're going. It doesn't buy your hand. It doesn't buy me blessings. My tithe and my offering, it reveals how much you can trust me. Today, Lord, above in that, above my tithe and offering, is a seed of honor because we have been honored to bring a bishop, an apostle, a coach, a father to impart into us. I declare today, going forward, I will walk straight. I'm going to act right. I'm going to tell the truth. And I will be blessed. And I will resist. And I will receive that suitcase of blessing. No matter what in hell comes my way, heaven is greater. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's 12. looked like today as you were leaning in to the Word of God and into today's service. So the next step for you is, man, apply that, take that into the highways and byways of your life, becoming a true disciple so you can go out, win souls, and make disciples. Yes, we are so happy that you joined us today. It was such an honor to have you with us. We pray that you feel inspired and encouraged by God's Word, and you're ready to go change your world today. Let's go, man. So jump on to jihow.net today. We got life groups. We got so many different things happening. We're on the Bible app so you can find some Bible study plans. There's so much stuff that we have available for you so that you can maximize your walk with God, get equipped in your journey with the Lord, and really go out there and have the tools to change your world for the glory of God. So that being said, we love you. We're praying for you. We bless you. We're so glad that you're a part of this journey with us. Now go and change your world this week. Thank you.